conversation with great words, especially with a captive audience. <laughs> and I see there's actually people in the front row, which makes a difference, doesn't it? Well, from your program, you'll we'll know that in 2011, the Great Art Group at Dunfermline Heritage Community Projects uh, began a survey of all gravestones in the Dunfermline Abbey graveyard. And once we finished the surface, surface stones, we started to look for buried ones. And that's what I want to tell you about today. I'll say a bit about the general history of the graveyard, then how we did our initial survey and the kinds of gravestones we found on the surface, and then we'll get on to the buried stones. Okay, where's the next one? Right. <laughs> For the benefit of people who don't know Dunfermline, is the location of the graveyard in relation to the view from Baptist Church. And it's about five minutes walk, as you'll find out, if you go on the Abbey tour this afternoon. There are two graveyards in the Abbey. The old ground is the original burial ground of the town, and it was in use from the building of the Abbey in 1120 until it was closed for burials in 1896. The north side of a church wasn't a favoured site for a graveyard, but the south side wasn't available because the Abbey precinct and the cloisters were there on that side. The new ground to the south and east was opened in 1823. As far as I know, it's still open for burials. I was amazed to find a record of one in 1972. From 2010 to 2011, 2012, we recorded all the surface gravestones and eventually there will be an interactive plan of them online. It's one of those things you leave to do after Christmas and then it never gets done. <laughs> the, um, a lot of moss had to be removed with wooden or plastic scrapers and brushes and then cleaned out of the lettering with toothpicks. If you're looking at gravestones for yourself, a credit card or something similar makes a good emergency scraper and you can clean out the lettering with a pencil or a biro. At the bottom left is a fragment with the earliest stone. It's a section of an early 14th century diamond or floriated cross stone that was reused by J.D. and his wife H.M. in 1787. Their initials are on the other side. There's half of a similar stone, not the same, but a similar one, that was used as a fireplace lintel in the 17th century phase of Abbott House. The rest of the pictures are of 19th century stones. Most of them are sandstone, and in some cases they're very badly flaked. <coughs> there are a few polished granite ones, like the pink one in the middle, and some of the sandstone ones were of very hard stone, as in bottom right, and the inscriptions are still as clear as the day they were carved. Dunfermline has a particularly good collection of low markers, that's top left on this slide, because until the, until the 1860s, no headstones higher than 12 inches were allowed in the graveyard. The headstone middle left is 18th century, and this is when symbols of mortality like this skull and crossbones were popular. I was amazed to find that many people think they mark the gravestone of a pirate. <laughs> it's actually the other way around. Pirates adopted the skull and crossbones as their trademark because it was so familiar. It was a symbol of death. The stone to the right is 19th century. The stones of this date have far more information on them. 18th century stones tend to have the name or initials of married couples and perhaps the trade of the husband, and that's about all. The flat stone at the bottom is the oldest dated stone in the graveyard. Barbara Stewart, who died in 1625. She was the wife of John Law, a member of the Dunfermline Merchant Guild, and their son Peter was provost of Dunfermline in 1640. The headstone on the right, which is, uh, you can't really see the inscription, but it says John Allister and Alison Williamson, has been deliberately laid flat because in 1762 the Kirk Session ordered all headstones to be laid flat to allow access for coffin bearers. The lower section has been deliberately roughened to improve anchorage in the ground. 
In the 1860s, a photographer who lived near the Abbey was very fond of taking pictures of the church, and he was probably the man who took this shot from the top of a tall building next to the graveyard. I've included it because you can see that it shows a lot of flat gravestones. Here's a view on the ground from the 1860s, that's at the top, and the same area in 2015, showing stones laid flat in the upper picture and upright in the bottom one. And we'll get to the reason for the difference in a minute. We know that the upper picture was taken in the 1860s because the obelisk that's outlined in red in the bottom one was put up in 1869. Okay, I'm pressing the button. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yes, I think. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> in 2012, we came across the Murray Burry, Burry Stones project and decided to use their methods to find buried stones in our graveyard. <clears throat> we informed the Abbey Kirk session as a courtesy, but they no longer own the graveyard. It now belongs to Five Council, so we had to ask them for permission to dig. We also had to get permission from Historic Environment Scotland because the graveyard is part of a scheduled monument. Their application process took about six weeks to go through the system, but now that permission has been granted, it's perpetual. As long as we submit a report on the dig every year, we don't have to reapply. We decided to dig in the old ground because most of the burials in the new ground are more recent and the stones are unlikely to have had a chance to sink. And here are the dig sites for the four years. <clears throat> we started by using probes similar to the ones recommended by the Murray Group. There's someone using it in the top left hand picture. And they were made by a member of our group. We had a lot of hits on solid objects in the northeast corner of the graveyard, so we decided to dig there. Five bereavement services erected barriers for us and detailed the relevant areas. We dug away and found not a single buried gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> what we did find was a compacted layer of 20th century demolition rubble, that's bottom left, and a lot of broken stone, hence the broken hits. We discovered the reason for this rubble there last year, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Among the rubble was a lot of broken china and glass, very often, very obviously late 19th or early 20th century. But fragments of Bakelite pointed to a 20th century rather than 19th century date. The only distinct find, finds were a very degraded possible section of an arch from the old church, that's that sort of white lump in the middle and half a clay pipe bowl identified as being made by the last clay pipe maker in Dunfermline. His gravestone's in the new ground and was recorded in our survey, which is just as well because it's now been pushed over. What was he pointing this in the wrong direction? Oh, that's it, right, thank you. Give me a wave if it works. <laughs> <coughs> we weren't discouraged by our lack of gravestones in 2013. We'd had a lot of fun doing the dig. Uh, however, we wanted to give ourselves a better chance in 2014, so we decided to try our luck on the western side of the graveyard. We did some more probing. Markers were placed wherever there was a hit, and this time the markers revealed the rectangular areas, you see in the top left, that actually proved to show where flat gravestones were buried. Five bereavement services again erected barriers, top middle picture, picture and deterred for us. This time we found five large flat stones and one laid flat headstone, and they're in the beige areas with letters on them in the plan. Area A, if you realise there isn't one, proved to have nothing in it. For most of the stones, it was possible to find out something about the people they belonged to. The one at the bottom left looked as though identifying the people would be an absolute doddle. It was dated 1645, and the inscription AWHD, 
and AWAR. <coughs> Neither a man with the initials AW and two wives, HD and AR, or a father and son in their wives. The wives looked easy to identify. Until about the mid-19th century, Scots used a very restricted set of Christian names. In 1645, a woman with the initial A would have been Agnes, Anna, or possibly Annabelle. The initial H would have meant Helen. The marriage and baptism records for the family are very complete for most of the 17th century, so it should be easy to find a man with the initials AW married to Agnes, Anna, or Helen. Not at all, there is absolutely no trace of them in the records. The one on the right was better. A lot of the inscription had been worn away, but there was enough left to be able to identify the owner as William Walker. Although he was a Dunfermline man, he was town clerk of Inverkeithing from 1744 until he died in 1791. Help, the man's gone. <laughs> discovered in 2014 was the use of water to reveal inscriptions. The stone at top left was the first one we uncovered and it looked totally blank, but when we poured water on it a circular motif appeared. It was still pretty indistinct and it didn't really tell us anything, but someone said it looked like a space helmet so we called it Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> the stone on the middle row was a lot better. Once again, when it was dry, nothing showed up, but the water treatment showed a very good example of a typical early 17th century stone with a wide border and chunky lettering. Most of the lettering was too indistinct to read, but we did manage to see a name, Johannes Brown, John Brown. From the records, we worked out that he was probably a Mortman who had a Maltings in the Netherton and a house in the High Street, and he died in 1605. <laughs> Last year's dig was very productive, and here's a diagram. The dark rectangles on the plans <coughs> plan are surface stones. We found 26 stones, 16 large flat ones, four low markers, and six laid flat ones. The usual reason for flat stones becoming buried is the natural growth of a few inches of turf over slabs that are left undisturbed for long periods. But many of the stones we found last year were as much as a foot deep or more. In other words, they sunk considerably and the cause was water running. Okay, can we have the next one, please? <laughs> Records begin in the 17th century and they show several ineffective attempts to break, drain the churchyard. The ground still becomes waterlogged in places after heavy rain, and this photo was taken in 2012, which you may remember was a particularly wet summer. The 2015 dig was in an area where waterlogging had obviously been particularly bad, possibly because of a dip in the heavy clay subsoil. This the before and after pictures of this table stone demonstrate this sinkage very well. Here the stone seems to be on pillars a few inches high. Ooh, it's working. It's because you're sitting there, that's right. <laughs> uh, here's what we found when we dug down beside the supports at the western end. There's been a grave plot originally marked by a double low marker and curved stones, and they've sunk and a table spoon has been erected on the plot at some time after the 1860s, and that's sunk as well. Last year's gravestones were also covered with 20th century demolition rubble. There were dumps of roof tiles and slates, glass, dom domestic ceramics, wall plaster and ash. We'd found out from research into the town council records during the winter of 2014 that in 1927 there had been a major refurbishment of the graveyard, which had included levelling operations. We seem to have found some of the levelling material in this also 
explain the compacted rubble layer we found in 2013. This slide has a few sections showing the levelling layer. Tiles and rubble in the top left picture. Pale grey ash in the right hand one. You'll see that the ash layer is overlaid by a surface flat stone. That can't have been laid on the grave after 1927 because the old ground was close to burials in 1896. We could only conclude that in the course of the refurbishment, this flat stone had been moved. And we found evidence of this relocation of gravestones in another area of the site as well. The bottom one uh, shows in some places there was a layer of pinkish sand that also seemed to be part of the levelling material. This relatively impenetrable layer of rubble and the extra depth of the stones caused by waterlogging meant that our small probes didn't really work on this site. One of the five grave diggers had been detailed to maintain the churchyard during the summer, and he gave us a great deal of help, including introducing us to the very robust probe used by the grave diggers, which would penetrate deeply into the soil and isn't deterred by rubble. We were gradually adapting our way of working to the unique conditions on our particular site. All oh, right, well, it doesn't matter. This was our last our stamp find last year. It was a 17th century grave stamp with inscriptions and a coat of arms. We couldn't take a decent photograph of it because we didn't have the right equipment to take the vertical photographs. So one of our artistic members did a drawing of it for us, which makes it much clearer. It marks the grave of James Dalgleish, who was master of Dunfermline Grammar School and died in 1610. The panel on the right gives an explanation of the stone. <coughs> The grave crop was sold in 1700 to George, George Turner, the local farmer, who replaced the first line of the inscription with his and his wife's initials. It would have originally have said something like, Hik Yakit Magister Jakobus Dalbich. Then we have the rest of the inscription, but his name keeps watch, etc. A friend of mine did the free translation for us. You'll see that the bottom row of initials includes his granddaughter, who was born about 1630. So the stone was laid some years after his death, probably by his widow, Janet Micklejohn, and her second husband, C.B., whoever he was. Their initials are either side of the shield. There's much more to James Dalglish's story, but there's no time to tell you about it now. This year's dig is still going on, of course, but I just wanted to say something about a couple of new techniques we're using now. The first was another tip from the council grave digger last year, using a turf wall to contain a spoil heap. If you're working in the field, of course, you have unlimited space for your spoil heap, but in a restricted space, it's useful to be able to contain it. Also, we've largely abandoned surface probing because the tile slate and rubble dumps produce false results, and there's always the possibility that stones would be too deep for probes to reach. Instead, we're digging trenches along the low, known lines of grave plots. Mark uses a series of metre-square holes because he has a big workforce and he wants to train them to do things properly. The DHCP workforce is much smaller and older, so we dig a long, narrow trench to a space <coughs> and then probe the bottom to see if there are any deep stones. This has the advantage that if the first half of the trench produces nothing, it can be backfilled with the spoil from the second half. Here's something new we found this year. In both of these trenches, a low marker has been installed in the mid 19th century by a grandchild of the original owner of the plot. And in both cases, the grandparent's original headstone has been carefully buried in front of the marker. So in future, we'll be investigating in front of low surface low markers to see if they have the same arrangement. The headstone on the left had flaked badly, so most of the inscription was indecipherable. But three letters are clear, E-E-V, and together with the graveyard records, they gave the clue to identifying the original owner of the plot, William Hogan, a mason whose wife was Margaret Beveridge. The low marker is dedicated to his grandson, also William Hogan, and three of his sons, William, James and Robert. This father and all three sons died of TB.
So, at the end of every site, there's the backfilling. <laughs> Reflecting on what's been learned and looking forward to next season. I hope I've shown you that graveyards are very interesting places. Whether you're looking on the surface or digging down underground. Archaeologically, they may come a bit low in the packing order, certainly when compared with Roman forts and Bronze Age burial grounds. But they have their place, and I think it's a valuable one. And I hope after hearing what I have to say that you agree with me. Thank you.